You want to prove that you can speak in the voice of the characters, contributing in the writer's room, not, not just sort of sitting there mm -hmm. having a bad attitude. A lot of this job is attitude. What really excited me was the idea of going against that grain, going against the mold, so to speak, of television and creating a character who was, by his very definition, designed to change. My personal philosophy is if it's a coincidence that's ultimately bad for the main character, then it's then it's then it's kosher, then it's acceptable. If it's a coincidence that's good for for that person, for that protagonist, then then it's lazy. Someone like us, uh, who for whatever reason actually did such a thing, actually decided to, to cook meth, and because uh, I was thinking instead, I was thinking, you know, why why would someone like me or Tom decide to do that. And then I thought, well, you know, you gotta, you gotta, you must need money. And, and one thing led to another. And by the time the phone call was over, uh, that, that moment of inspiration had, had led to, uh, I didn't have a name for him yet, but led to that character who would eventually be known as, as Walter White. And before that, in about 2004, uh, I was talking to a buddy of mine, a guy named Tom Schnauz, who's one of our uh, writer, producer, directors on uh, Better Call Saul and, and, on, and uh, previously on Breaking Bad. And around about 2004, we'd been out of work for two years. X-Files had been off the air since about 2002. And we were on the phone just bemoaning the fact that we, we couldn't find uh, another writing job uh, that, that was... I was about to say that it was near as good as the X-Files. We couldn't find a writing job at all. We were kind of, it was kind of lean, slim pickings uh, at that point. And uh, I said, uh, you know, what are we going to do now? And he said, why don't we get a uh, Winnebago uh, caravan, I guess, uh, in Australia. And why don't we get a caravan and, uh, you know, put a meth lab in the back of it and ride around America and see the sights and cook meth and make some money. So this is and a documentary? <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> What was interesting is that in the moment he made that joke, uh, this sort of little eureka moment hit me because uh, I'm a very boring, uh, law-abiding guy, and and he is too, uh, despite his sense of humor. And it 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 dawned on me as he was making this joke that would be an interesting character to write about, someone like us uh, who, for whatever reason actually did such a thing, actually decided to, to cook meth. And because uh, I was thinking instead, I was thinking, you know, why, why would someone like me or Tom decide to do that? And then I thought, well, you know, you got to, you got to, you must need money. And, and one thing led to another. And by the time the phone call was over, uh, that, that moment of inspiration had, had led to, uh, I didn't have a name for him yet, but led to that character who would eventually be known as, as Walter White. And that's very rare, having that kind of, uh, you know, for the writers in the audience. I don't know how it is for you folks, but in, in writing is, is, is hard work, and, and you got to really, you know, keep your, keep your uh, pencil to the grindstone, so to speak. And, but every now and then, when that inspiration hits, that's a wonderful thing. But, um, in terms of believability, uh, how do you write a show like Breaking Bad, which revolves a lot around coincidence, like uh, characters meeting in certain places, and still keep it believable? There were there were some there were some uh, there were some big there were a couple of big moments of coincidence. Uh, the biggest one probably would you say I'm going to guess would you say is when Walt sat down at the bar next to G yeah that was a big moment and we talked a lot about that and my personal philosophy on that you know, I think some of these guys said that's that's kind of a big coincidence isn't it? My personal philosophy is if it's a coincidence that's ultimately bad for the main character then it's then it's then it's kosher, then it's acceptable. If it's a coincidence that's good for, for that person, for that protagonist, then, then it's lazy. But in that case, it, in, in, in short-term fashion, it wound up moving Walt's uh, machinations a little further along, but it also stole a big, it led to him killing or, or allowing, he didn't kill her, but he allowed Jane to die in the next scene, Jane, uh, Jesse's girlfriend. And therefore, he lost a big chunk of his soul. We talked a lot about that, about uh, what, what, yeah, coincidences. I, I just, I was intrigued 
at the idea of taking a uh, a good man, a uh, good you know the the protagonist, the, the the good guy, and turning him into that was the part I left out in this pitch. What really interested me, aside from this character, you know, why would he do this thing and whatnot, was it dawned on me that television, of which I am a giant fan, uh, historically exists. Uh, TV shows exist uh, in a kind of a stasis world. Uh, you know, when you watch uh, Bart Simpson for 30 years now on, on uh, The Simpsons, he never grows up. He never becomes a different character than he is. Uh, all, all the great TV shows uh, in history, uh, it, it's, it, it, it's helpful for the characters to not change because if they were to change, you know, you don't have that comfort of inviting them into your room week, week upon week and not knowing what you're going to get. It's better for Marshall Dillon to stay Marshall Dillon for 20 years on Gunsmoke and, and whatnot. And what really excited me, and this, I think, I, uh, came a bit later than that phone call with my buddy, what really excited me was the idea of going against that grain, going against the mold, so to speak, of television and creating a character who was, by his very definition, designed to change uh, and of course, when you have a character ch who changes, when that's your by design, that's what your TV show is. It it therefore becomes a finite TV show instead of a uh, well, not there's no infinite TV show, but you, you want a TV show that can go on. Typically, you want one that can go on indefinitely. Hence the the stasis that you you seek. But I I figured, you know, I'm I'm kind of lazy. I don't want a show to go on 20 years if I get that lucky. That's too much work. Let's do a finite TV show. The good guys are going to turn into the bad guy, and then and then it's all over. So but the kind of stuff we did on the X-Files was the hard work, the heavy lifting of, of the job was we would sit in front of a cork board three feet by five feet with a big thing of thumbtacks and a big thing of index cards and a whole bunch of Sharpie magic markers. And we'd sit there and we'd say, okay, what's the teaser? What, you know, what... What, what's we know we're doing an episode about Aztec mummies, so what's the teaser? You know, what's what's a really scary teaser? And you build it brick by brick. You know, each card represents a a, a, a plot beat, not necessarily a scene, but you know, three or four, six, eight cards might represent one scene, but each one of those cards is is some indispensable plot beat of that scene, and and you you, you break the story. You build it, in other words, brick by brick, index card by index card, and and put it up there. You know, wanted you know, and it and and by the end of it, you filled up this entire three foot by five foot cork board with a teaser and 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 the the, the four act structure that we would do in the X Files, which we also do in Breaking Bad. Teaser act, I guess it's five acts if you count the teaser. Teaser act one, act two, act three, act four, and this whole. This whole three foot by five foot board is filled with pinned up index cards by the time you're done. Most episodes of Breaking Bad are like a math formula. They're like a math problem. And I always wondered if there was a really great Faulty Towers episode where they admitted like we started with the last scene and wrote backwards like how did how did he get how did Basil Faulty get to this scene? Right, right. And I and so I watch a lot of Breaking Bad episodes and there's the math formula where they get into some really stressful predicament, the kind where you're like, oh, come on, you know? And then not only do they get out of it, but it's believable, and it's the only way they could have gotten out of it. And that, to me, seems like, are, are, are you starting at the beginning and writing to that point? Are you, fi are you getting to, are you starting at the end and then going backwards and, and kind of backtracking to get them out of it? We did a little bit of everything in the five or six years we're, Five years we're doing this. We did a little bit of everything. Um, I'm so glad that it felt that way. Uh, I can, I can, I can tell you for a fact. None of us in the writers' room, especially me, were any kind of mathematical geniuses. So I was, I was doing an interview uh, before we got out here. A young lady was asking, you know, uh, when were the couple times? You know, can you name some times you wrote yourselves into into a real corner? And uh, the biggest one of all is, is Walt buys this machine gun uh, at this at the beginning of the 16, the run of 16 episodes, final 16 episodes, we had no friggin' clue what he was buying the machine gun for. <laughs> really? And it was so, in hindsight, it was so stupid. But I just thought it'd be cool, hey, he buys a machine gun. I, we always, what, and then it's, and then we'll figure it out later, we'll figure it out. Oh my God. Uh, we really did, I'm not actually proud of that. Um, <laughs> I, we would give all these, ponderous interviews over the years to places like the Writers Guild magazine or whatnot. 
Uh, we believe in organic storytelling, which, which stems from, flows from character, does not flow from plot. And, and by the way, I, I really do believe in organic storytelling, but every now and then we just go batshit and we <laughs> put a machine gun in a trunk or the other time was, you know, Walt Jesse in the RV and, and Hank has is, uh, is, is, is got him in the junkyard dead That's to rights. That's the scene I was thinking of. Yeah, that was one like, of the two I mentioned. Yeah yeah, 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 yeah. So you really went through a detailed pitch of the pilot. Yeah, yeah. And then, obviously, you must have talked about where it was going from there. Did you have the full five-year plan no, in your head? Or? No, not at all. I, 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 I pitched in great detail, as I say, that first episode, and, and I hoped that that would hook these, these potential buyers, right. and luckily it, it did. Uh, and then when they said, where does it go from there, I, I would say, I would get very general at that point, but I would say something that, that we did abide by for the whole six years. I would say, this is a show about process, it's a show about transformation. It's a show about a guy willfully transforming himself from who he used to be to what he will become and what he will become if you give me the time to do it. Uh, and I can't tell you right now how many years I think it should be, but I, what I want to do with this show is I want to take this Mr. Chips character and have him turn himself into, into Scarface. And it was, it, was, it was that general, and that was the pithy one-line sentence that I've probably said like balloons should drop from the ceiling. It's probably the millionth time I've said it. <laughs> but uh, but it, it's, it's that old cliche about it's good to have this one sentence pitch that, that people remember. And I, I, I have to say, this, this, one, this one helped me out a great deal. This was a, a good one sentence pitch for this show. And we, yeah. and we stuck by that uh, self-imposed franchise. We, that's, that's, what, that's what the show was. Thinking so. about your experiences in the writer's room, what is it that you think makes for a good staff writer? This is going to sound terrible, but I don't know how else to put it. You really want to write in, in the voice of the show. It's not a time and a place, at least at the beginning of, of, your, of your being hired. It's not really a, the optimal time and a place for you to express lots of individuality. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you really want to... You want to prove that you can speak in the voice of the characters, contributing in the writer's room, not, not just sort of sitting there mm -hmm. having a bad attitude. A lot of this job is attitude. If you're not already this person, pretend to be, but be someone that people want to spend 10, 11, 12 hours at a stretch yeah, with. Yeah. One of the most important things in a TV writer's room is just, to, is just to keep the conversation going. Come up with dumb ideas. Not be afraid to come up with what you know is potentially a dumb idea. Because the dumb ideas, and I've seen it more times than I can count, very often lead mm -hmm. to the good idea. And once you started as a teenager to write, you know, essays for school and stories, were, were they always, right, people who've read your, people who've come across your stuff said, I read this script from you and I thought, wow, yeah. it's just on another level to what people do. Was your writing always of quality? I, I don't think so. I, <laughs> I, uh, I think... If you, if you start with an enthusiasm towards something, uh, you, you probably... I mean, I think I started off just uh, writing as piss poorly as, <laughs> as anyone. But uh, I think that, uh, uh, you know, try and try again. You, you, keep, you keep doing, you keep at it, you keep hammering away at it. I, I don't think my writing was anything special for, for a great many years. Uh, but but I, I love doing it, and I, I did it to the exclusion of, of many other things that uh, would have made me a more well-rounded person, perhaps. Sorry of you, but um, about selling the show, how do you sell a show like this to a network? You know, you just um, well, I can I I, I I seem to hesitate. I hesitate when you ask because I don't know how you do it except put like you do everything else, put one foot in front of the other, come up with something. In this case, that you really believe, I really believed in this. And then go and uh, pitch it as best you can, and let the chips fall where they may. The people are either going to buy it or they're not. I, I, I seem to be at that early stage. As I said earlier, I was I was worried perhaps too much uh, about Walt remaining sympathetic, and so I I arrayed against him his brother-in-law, who was by design everything that Walt was not. And he's kind of a hail fellow well met frat boy kind of a as you say he's kind of an asshole mm. jock. And, and, it, and, it, and it makes it uh, even more painful for Walt that Walt's own son seems to gravitate more toward his, his fire-pissing uncle than he does the old man, you mm. know. And, um, but once, once I got to know Dean Norris, who, 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 who plays Hank, I started to realize how complex an individual he is and how interesting and how talented and multifaceted he is. And some of those, and my writers did as well, and some of those complexities and, and facets uh, made their way to the writing of, of the character, and, and, and the character became less of a less of a jerk and, and more of a 
interesting, uh, well-rounded individual. Mm. That's, that's what I love about this process of television production. You, you, you roll with the punches. Sometimes your job is, is taking lemons and turning them into lemonade. You know, sometimes actors suddenly become unavailable. Sometimes, like at one point, the house Jesse Pinkman lived in got sold out from under us and we could no longer shoot there. You have to roll with these punches, but, but sometimes they make the show better.